everybody? Everybody awake? How's it been? Has it been awesome? Okay. All right, awesome. Um, okay, can we start my presentation? It, it, the, the first slide has that on it. There we go. All right. Then slide two. Um, oh, I have to do it? I, I'm like an old lady. I don't know how to do these kind of things. Okay, so just right here. Okay, big green one in the middle. I, I can do that. Oh, the other green one in the middle. Okay. <laughs> I just did an interview um, with, the, with the digital people, and they were asking me what I thought about tech and how it plays a role in this. I said, well, you're talking to a 56-year-old woman, so I'm not very good at it, but I certainly have a great appreciation for it. Um, so what I'd like to talk with you about is um, maybe something that's a little bit different from what everybody's here is, is listening to, because I know that um, we've got people uh, maybe from a lot of the same types of political perspectives. Um, I'm guessing, if you label yourself a progressive, raise your hand. Okay, gotcha. If you ask that question in my congressional district, you wouldn't see that same reaction. So here's what I want to talk to you about. What do you think those three things have in common up there? One is a bench, and that's actually at the WNBA. You know, that's what the benches look like now. They're all comfortable. Very different from my days playing sports when you sat on the bleachers. One is a bench, one obviously is a sailboat, and then one is a big tent. And um, I'll, I'll tell you what I see as those having in common. Um, first of all, we've got to have a strong bench at every single level of governing. And I don't care if it's the library board, the county board, the city council, the township board, Congress. We've got to have a strong bench to be successful going forward. And I'll tell you what, what I'm doing to try to play a part in that. Number two, the sailboat. Um, if we harness energy, you know, think about how a sailboat works, right? If you harness all that wind and it gets behind that sail, that's how you go places. When you have wind blowing in this direction and wind blowing in this direction, you're sitting still. You're not advancing. And then the big tent, and this, this is really the moral of the story that I'd like to share with you this morning. And I'm going to go through this somewhat fast because I want to answer as many questions you have because I, I um, get some level of skepticism when I talk about how I see the big tent versus maybe how some other people see the big tent. But I think that the big tent is one that as Democrats, we need to value every sort of diversity there is. And uh, that means geographic diversity on top of ethnic and racial and gender and age and occupational. Um, and when I talk about geographic diversity, I'm even talking about the state of Illinois. Um, are, ha, raise your hand if you're not from Illinois. Oh, so we've got people from, okay. All right, raise your hand if you're from Illinois. All right, okay, that gives, that, I, I appreciate that. That, that gives me, that gives me a, a pretty good example of that. So, um, so for those of you not from Illinois, um, is that downtown Chicago? <laughs> That's a downtown in Galena, Illinois, which is in my congressional district, all right? Let me, let me tell you a little bit who I am and why I'm standing in front of you. I am the only Democrat in the U.S. or in the Illinois congressional delegation. The only Democrat in the Illinois congressional delegation from outside Chicagoland. So if you picture Illinois, Chicago's just in this, you know, upper right-hand corner. And then my congressional district is the entire west, northwestern part of the state. It's 7,000 square miles. It's 14 counties. It's very rural, very rural. More than 50% of the towns that I represent are 1,000 people or fewer. 85% of the, the towns that I represent are 5,000 people or fewer, okay? So this is downtown Galena, and it's the type of town that I represent. And um, so I'm standing here in front of you with a little bit of a, a different political perspective. In Washington, D.C., we have a leadership table. We get together, we, we fly in either on a Monday or Tuesday when we're in session, and one of the first meetings I have after I get into town is a leadership meeting. I sit around that leadership table because I'm one of three co-chairs of a policy and communications committee. Um, I was elected among my peers for that. 
And um, sitting around that table, you know how many Midwesterners are sitting around the table? Thank you, Deborah Shore. Deborah Shore's, Deborah Shore's right. There's one. Okay? So when, in, in for anybody, for any woman in this room especially, for any person of color in this room, you know that when you're sitting around a table and you're the only one like that, you don't have people who echo um, what you're saying. And I would contend that in every congressional district in this country that is a democratic district, we have Democrats. So if we're going to win back the House of Representatives, we've got to figure out how we are going to play in districts like mine that Donald Trump won. There are a dozen congressional seats out of the 194 Democrats that are in Congress, a dozen that Democrats are, are serving from that Donald Trump won. I'm one of those 12, okay? So, but if we are going to win back the majority, we've got to pick up 23 seats. They are not going to come from Democratic districts because we already have Democrats there. So it is places like this, and my call out to you as you become active and increase your activity in political circles, don't forget towns like this. I'm very, very lonely as a Democrat in downstate Illinois, and I really want company. And what I'm doing to, to try to help grow the company that I want is we started a program called Build the Bench. I'll tell you why I started it. Last election cycle, I was the vice chair of recruitment for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. I, I helped recruit candidates all over this country. And, um, and I traveled um, to, to campaign for women candidates because that's, that's my passion. My passion is electing more women, electing more people of color, electing more younger people. I have nothing against white guys at all. Um, my, my point for saying that, though, it is where we are underrepresented is in those three areas. So I worked very hard to recruit people um, when I was vice chair of recruitment from those categories. Um, but then I realized in our own state of Illinois, we struggled with some of the congressional districts and finding the right fit for those districts. So I started this program called Build the Bench. I called it that because I'm a, I was a college basketball player. Anybody play sports here at any level? Okay. So the couple guys in the back. Um, <laughs> I still play sports. I'm, I'm on the Congressional Women's Softball team. I love it. I'll tell you about that. That's a whole other story. But um, so anybody play basketball? All right, so the basketball players. Actually, any team sport. OK, basketball, you have five players on the, on the court. What happens when somebody fouls out, when somebody gets injured, when somebody gets tired? If you've got a strong bench that you can pull from, that's how you can keep playing and stay strong through the entire game. That's how you win games. And so when I recognized that we had too hard of a time finding people, for instance, from library boards or city councils or town councils uh, to pick from, um, or just people who would self-select and say, you know, they were, they were a leader in their communities, um, I wanted to make sure that we did something about that. So I started this program called Build the Bench. And um, we have been doing this now for a, a couple years. We've got one coming up in one of the collar counties. If you know of anybody who would like to learn the fundamentals, it's a one-day boot camp. It doesn't cost anybody who participates anything. I pay for all of it out of my leadership pack. And it's a one-day boot camp that we're doing all, all throughout the, the state of Illinois, and we're branching out throughout the Midwest now. But we learn the fundamentals of messaging, grassroots organizing, fundraising, and digital social media. All right, so it's just it's those four planks, which if you can get those things right, that's at least a pretty good start. But we do that in an all-day boot camp, and um, we've had tremendous success so far. Um, of those who have run, that have gone through our program, 71% of them have won. And, um, and, and they're defying the odds. And let me just tell you about Nikita Richards. Nikita's from uh, Bloomington, Illinois. Again, those of you from Illinois know where Bloomington is. It's... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, it's called Bloomington Normal. There's two um, towns in that, in that region. But um, I always love that name, Normal, don't you? Like, who thought to name the town Normal? I, I, just, I, I always thought that was a pretty good name of a town. And um, so, so Nikita is from Bloomington. And, you know, she's not a woman who was running around with politicians. She was not a, a woman who was well-connected, so to speak. Um, but she knew that she wanted to run for office. 
and it, it, from, for a long time she wanted to run for office, but when, after November, she really wanted to run for office, just like so many of you. You know, that, that November 2016 is, was just one of those life-changing moments where it's like, what in the heck do we need to do to make sure that we're bringing about change? Nikita is one of those persons. So um, I met her casually. I said, I want you to go through Build the Bench, and um, then you can make a determination of what you're going to do. And now, uh, in a, uh, against the odds, she's a, she's a single mom. Um, she comes from a very... Uh, a, a, a county that's not overly diverse, and um, and she's made a decision that she's going to run for McLean County Clerk. Um, now we'll see how she does in November, but she is doing all the right things. She is a sponge for soaking up inf information, and uh, I hope that she will add to our 71 percent rate and, uh, and and be highly successful. But if you can help someone like Nikita, just give that some thought. If you can give her five bucks or whatever, it, it, it takes resources. But I'll do a shout out for her because I think very, very highly of her. Um, so what happened then after November of, of 2016? Not only did it promote people, prompt people like you to want to get involved, people like Nikita Richards to, to want to get involved, but it also, um, my colleagues, in the U.S. House of Representatives, they, they turned to me and they said, how in the heck did you win by 20 points in a district that Donald Trump won? And again, I, I explained my, my district briefly, but it goes over to the, the Mississippi River's my western border, goes up to the Wisconsin line. Um, there, the 14 counties, the 11 of the 14 are almost entirely rural. Donald Trump won some of those counties by double digits. And again, I won, that, I won our entire district by 20 points. And my colleagues then elected me to uh, sit at the leadership table. And then the folks at the, on the political end of things asked if I would share what I've learned in my, um, now I'm in my third term in Congress, with other people who are looking to run. So um, I am now this election cycle, I am working with candidates from throughout the, the entire heartland. And again, I want to get back to this for just a second. Um, the importance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sh show you three candidates running in the Midwest, and I, I bring this up one more time to say we've got to work together, we cannot work against each other, uh, because not every candidate who is running in these congressional districts is going to agree with you 100% of the time. Let me just tell you um, three different candidates. I just got to Chicago late last night after a very, very long day in the Minneapolis airport because of weather problems. My flying has just been absolutely terrible lately. But, I, but I, w I was up in Minnesota to campaign for this woman. Her name's Angie Craig. And she is going to win. And let me just tell you very briefly about her. She grew up dirt poor. And I do mean dirt poor. Uh, single mom. Uh, grew up, she grew up in a trailer and uh, literally had nothing. Her mom because she was not educated but wanted to get ahead, would go to night school. It took her nine years, her mother nine years, to get her teaching degree. And her mother is in her 60s now and is still teaching. But Angie paid her own way through college, um, and then she went on to be a newspaper reporter, which is what I did for a living, so I, like, totally love her. And then she, after that, she went on to be um, on the senior leadership level of a Fortune 500 company totally self-made, very, very successful. And she has made this determination that she wants to bring about change. So she is running against a sitting Republican in Minnesota, and she's got every opportunity to win. Let me just tell you a very quick story about Angie that tells you about her, um, how tenacious she is. So as a newspaper reporter, she gets, um, anybody here a, a reporter, former reporter, anything like that? Well, okay, well back in the day, because uh, I started out on the cop beat, you'd have the police scanner going, and any time you would hear something called a 1050 PI, that meant that there was an accident, and it meant that there was a personal injury PI, and you went out to every one of those to find out what was going on. And so she goes out there, she's on an overpass, figures out she can't go beneath to where the accident site is, so she has her photographer lower her from the overpass down so she can interview the police officers and and uh, get the story. That's how tenacious she is, all right? And she's going to win. So keep your eye out for her. Um, this next candidate right here, this is Amy McGrath. If you haven't seen her launch video, 
I love that reaction. I'm, she's coming to Chicago. I can't talk about it because it's a political end, but I'm bringing her to Chicago for an event. We'll talk about that separately if you want to know. Um, but Amy McGrath, if you haven't watched her launch video, watch it. She writes her congressman when she's a kid saying she wants to be a fighter pilot. Her congressman says, you can't, you're a girl. All right, so she becomes the first Marine female ever in the history of our country to fly a F-18 into combat. All right, now she just won her primary in Kentucky against all odds. She's going to win. All right, and then lastly, and you're going to hear from Lauren Underwood later today. So Lauren Underwood, 31 years old, a nurse, uh, has a, a heart issue, and she sees the folks on the other side of the aisle doing everything they can to take away health coverage from people. And that is motivation enough for her to li and listen to her primary. I know some of you know this story. Seven-way primary, seven-way primary, and she gets 60% of the vote, so she's going to win as well. So, um, so in in closing, in closing, and then if I have time for questions, I would love to take questions. If I don't, um, I, I certainly understand. Um, but let's get back to the the, the this these symbols again, okay? Um, Please understand that we've got to be on the same page, all right? I know the term litmus test has gotten um, some publicity, mostly not very good. But I'm telling you, if, you were running, if you're running in a district like Amy McGrath is in Kentucky, or Lauren Underwood is in downstate Illinois, or Angie, Angie Craig is in Minnesota, um, that you have to figure out how you're going to get independent votes and even Republican votes in order to win. You, they cannot win those districts without getting those votes. It doesn't mean we abandon what our principles are, our values are, what we stand for as Democrats. It never means that, but it just means that we're not going to be on the same page 100% of the time. What I would ask of you is let's not beat each other up. Let's make sure that we are the wind behind the sails, all of us together. Um, and that is how we're going to be successful. That's how we're going to win back the House. I know you heard from J.B. Pritzker yesterday. That's how we're going to win back the governor's seat in the state of Illinois. That's how we're going to hang on to the majority in the state of Illinois and win back the majorities in the state legislatures throughout the country. We've got to be together, okay? Thank you very much. And um, do I have time for, okay. I, I, I have time, it sounds like, two, for two or three questions, Genevieve is saying. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. You guys can ask me anything. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Tell me your from first, Gary, tell me your first Indiana, name again. Originally, my You're, name is Norma Carey. Norma, okay. I'm from Gary, Indiana. I currently live in one of the small cities, uh, like the one you're indicating there. Yes. Um, my question right now is, first of all, I'm really interested in your, um, uh, your boot camp. I'll yep. talk about that later. Yep. But then now, as in Indiana, what can we do, what can I do in Indiana? I've tried to contact Indivisible, having, having difficulty really contacting Indivisible. I've been able to get some emails from National Indivisible, but not getting anything else. Then... So now my question is, all right, like Joe Donnelly, you know, I can call him up, stuff like that. Does it help for us to, what, first help with our state reps and then push them into Congress? Or, you know, what can we really do here to kind of get things moving in Indiana? You can do any and all of the above. It's kind of like check the box, check the box, check the, bo check the box. Um, Joe Donnelly is going to need your help. I mean, he's, he's got a tough race ahead, and we need to make sure that we hang on to that seat. Oh, I know. Um, they but, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but know. as far as, like, where people come from to run, you, I mean, again, Lauren Underwood, she's a nurse. She's never run for anything in her life. Betsy Dirksen Londrigan, who's running out of central Illinois, has never run for anything in her life. Um, we, we've okay. got people, Amy McGrath has never run for anything in her life. Okay, so they're just bootstrapping up. But, but, but so in, in our boot camp is just about learning those fundamentals. And if you want to send, we'll hopefully do one in Indiana or partner with anybody in Indiana. But, but my answer to you, Norma, is do anything you can. 
Um, I'm going to use a Jan Schakowsky line that I just used in an interview. Jan Schakowsky, who's our member of Congress from, from uh, the, this region, uh, mm -hmm. she always says, I only need two things from you. I need your time and I need your money. Okay. And, and well, there's a lot of truth to that, you know, and again, even if, even if you don't have the resources to do much, if you can give somebody a dollar or five bucks, and if you can give somebody an hour of your time a week or a month, that's still something that they're not getting right now. So get, just get involved in whatever way is comfortable for you. But I, it, since you said uh, Joe Donnelly, give him a call. Um, he would welcome your help, I guarantee you. Okay. All right. Very thank, good. Thank, thank you, you Norma. so much. Thank you. I yes, sir. I was going to say thank you for volunteering with us for Thanks, the last Norma. two days. Norma's run our registration. <laughs> She's a powerhouse. Um, she, and she wrote a book. <laughs> awesome. Oh, awesome. those flyers are in the front. Can I ask a question, too, uh, after somebody else? I just want to say, what's the number one thing stopping women from running? You know, um, when I was recruiting last election cycle, it was so similar. It, it, every, almost every single woman, when we would start that process of talking with them about running, and number one, it was almost always family. Um, you know, like the age of kids. You almost never hear a man say that, and I kid you not. Um, the first question I would typically get from, from a man would be, can I win? Seriously, that was almost always the first question, you know, like, what's the political makeup? Can I win this? And the f almost always the first question from a woman would be, what does this do to your family? And um, so what I would say, what, and we, here's how I would handle that. I would get my very, very good friend, Grace Meng, who is a member of Congress from the state of New York. She was elected the same time I was. She has two little boys. And I can tell you, we will literally be walking over to the House floor when we're called for votes. And she is Skyping, uh, doing homework, math problems with her kids as we're walking over. She'll go on the House floor, she'll vote, she'll go back to the cloakroom, continue her doing homework with her kids. And um, I mean, it is doable. I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy on a family, because I don't think it is. Um, you've got to have understanding loved ones. I mean, you really do, because I almost think it's, it's like people in the military, right? You've got men and women fighting under just horrible circumstances, but then when you have the spouse and the kids back home, it is very hard on them as well. Um, but, but there are ways to work around all of that kind of stuff, but that's typically the first question I get from women. Okay, and I had already called on you. Yes, sir, say your name too. My name is Michael Smith. I am the Deputy Political Director for the College Democrats of America, and I'm running for Political Director this upcoming year. Good and for I was just you. Thank you. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Palatine, Illinois, Great. but I am uh, the president at the Alabama College Democrats. Okay. Yeah. How many Alabama Democrats are there? <laughs> well, ever since December, it's gone up by a lot. It's gone from two to four, or <laughs> four to eight? <laughs> uh, um, last year, we were actually the largest delegation of any state um, in College Democrats convention. Um, but I just want to bring up with you, I know you. Uh, and Doug Jones, Senator Doug yeah. Jones, what, what an awesome success story. That would be something, Genevieve, for a future presentation. Have Doug Jones's team come in and talk about how they won that. A huge salute to African American women. He never would have won that race without the African American women who supported him so strongly. Well, I know you really are interested in building a bench. What would you tell um, younger millennials and Generation Z of getting engaged in politics and one day running for awesome office themselves? Get involved. You know, I, I first went door to door for uh, Paul Simon. Anybody here remember Paul Simon? But for Paul Simon when I was 10 years old. And, um, you know, I mean, I was, I was kind of a nerd. I mean, I was, a, I was kind of a weird nerd. I mean, I, I played sports, but I still loved politics, which is, you know, a lot of... I mean, it's a little bit of an odd combina combination, but, um, and there's Lauren Underwood right there, by the way. We were just talking about you, Lauren. Um, so get involved. And, and I can tell you this, that you guys think about, every person in this room, think about when you are looking to promote somebody or, or think about when you've been promoted. It's almost always because you go above and beyond, right? I always, I have three sons. I told all of them, when you go in for a job interview, you don't leave that job interview without saying that, you know, I will do what it takes to make sure that we are successful. If you need me to empty the trash, I will empty the trash. If you need me to go make coffee, I will make coffee. Um, I will do what it takes to be successful. And I also teach my kids that before you leave work for the day, stick your head in your, your boss's office or 
um, your foreman's office or, or, or wherever your foreman is, and just say, hey, I'm getting ready to take off. Is there anything else you need for the day? So my advice to anybody is um, start out by volunteering and go above and beyond as a volunteer. You will get noticed. And um, I, I just got asked the question of what would my wish be for um, if I had one thing that I could ask for, and I'm like, ask for politically or ask for, you know, like world peace type stuff. And they said, well, it can be as broad as you want. And I, and I, and I said, I, I would wish self-confidence, especially for girls. And because women, girls, we got to know that we don't have to sit in the corner. And um, we can speak out. We can sit in the front row. Um, we do deserve to have a seat at that leadership table. And, um, and a lot of that starts with self-confidence. Okay, did that, I'm not, I don't, I'm not being overly specific. The other thing is, what, what campaign or what political office or governmental office doesn't have internships? They all do. They all do. Intern. How I built my resume um, was I, I worked in a lot of places for free. <laughs> and, um, and, and again, I would, I'm a sponge as a former, you know, as a newspaper reporter for 17 years. And so I love other people's stories and I love learning and getting information. And, um, uh, you know, learn every, the, these jobs maybe where you're not getting paid, learn at all of them and you will continue to move up. It's a, you, anybody can be successful in this line of work. It just takes hard work and, um, you know, and, and sticking with it. Do I have time for one more question, Genevieve, or is that it? One more? Okay, one, one more question. Yes, sir. Are you a pharmacist? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> Did, doesn't he look like a pharmacist? Could you tell how I could tell that? <laughs> I thought you looked like a pharmacist, though. <laughs> My name is Ron Cook. I do a lot of volunteer work here for the Democratic Party of Oak Park, originally from Bloomington, Normal, oh, yeah, Illinois. Yeah. Great name. Um, and um, uh, I hear a lot of our Democrats are wor winning because w they're wor working the primary issue of health care. Mm -hmm. And I know Democrats have a lot of trouble with messaging. Are there any other issues besides health care that you think we should be pushing? Yes, I think it should be. Um, health care is definitely something we should be talking about. Did anybody see the 60 Minutes uh, story three weeks ago that talked about this pharmaceutical company that increased the price of a drug from $40 in 2001 to $40,000 today. Um, the reason I paid such, such close attention to that is because that story came out of my congressional district. And it's a, and it's a part of our, our state of Illinois that's struggling. And they're self-insured and they've got to pay out of pocket for this. And this is a drug that is absolutely needed, and you would probably understand this at a much deeper level than I, but that is needed for these babies to stay alive. And, you know, it's like the EpiPen, right? I mean, my, one of my sons has a bee allergy. You need to have those EpiPens for your, your kid or, you know, they're going to, they could die. So um, healthcare is definitely a winner. Uh, also, you know, people's real income has not gone up for more than a decade now. Come to my district, go to, go to Galesburg, Illinois. The Maytag plant, 14 years ago, sent every last job over to Mexico. People who worked there 14 years ago are making half what they did back then, and they're having to work two jobs to make half what they did back then. So people's real incomes are, yeah, and pe people are struggling. And, I, and keep in mind, again, in my congressional district, family of four, makes $45,000 a year. That's, that's the median income of a family of four in my congressional district. So again, in the kind of congressional districts, the kind of regions that we've got to figure out how we're going to win back, we, we better make sure that we understand that. And, and, and how I frame something like that is, if you want to stay at Trump International Hotel, and anybody ever go out to Washington, D.C.? When you go out there, anybody stay at Trump's hotel? Anybody stay at the Franklin suite of the Trump Hotel? You know what it costs a night to stay there? $5,500. That takes people in my district, a whole family, a month and a half. It'd take a month and a half pay to pay for one night at the Franklin suite at the Trump International Hotel. Um, so that's how I frame it. So you, you, we got to talk about the things that people are struggling with still. And then lastly, when candidate Trump talked about draining the swamp, he is now, as President Trump, I, I was trying to think about how best do, do we describe this, and I was thinking, 
you know, visually, I, I picture President Trump on a high dive, like a really, really, really high dive, and diving deep into the swamp, and just swimming, and then coming out like really gross, um, because it is terrible. The fact that Ben Carson from Housing and Urban Development, he wants to raise people who are living in public, any kind of public housing, he wants to raise their leases three times what they're paying right now. But then he goes out and buys a $31,000 dining room set. Um, or how about Mnuchin and, and going to see the solar eclipse with his wife that cost taxpayer on a, on a military jet? I mean, what, you know, and, and, but, but at the same time, you know, we're, most people are left in the dark and wondering about what their own economic uh, future is going to be. So I, I, the other thing that I frame it is, We've got to make things work again in Washington. I would say the number one thing I hear this, and I'll, I'm wrapping up right now, Genevieve. Um, I do something called Supermarket Saturdays, um, where all I do is walk the aisles of the grocery stores in my district, and um, I've got zero agenda other than, than to know what's on people's minds. All right, and I do this virtually every week. I do that, and one other thing that I do is uh, we call it Sherry on Shift, where I job shadow people, and I'm standing shoulder to shoulder on you know whether it's. I'm now a certified forklift driver. Um, I have been a beekeeper. I have been a grocery store sacker. Um, I have been a carp processor. I have, meaning, you know, carp out of the Mississippi River. I, anyway, I've done 60 plus of these. But what, you, you get to know people um, when you're, when you say, you know, tell me about your, you know, the last time you got a raise. And um, tell me about, are you, you know, do you, can you take your family on vacation every year? And, um, uh, there was a home care nurse who told me that when I asked what she did for fun, I usually like to ask people what they do for fun because it gets at what people's discretionary income is. And when I asked her that, she, she works full time, her husband works full time, they have two kids, and she said, um, we have cable television. So what most of us take for granted, um, she couldn't afford to go to a movie, buy popcorn and soda for their family of four, and so they do that at home. But that is a long way of saying the, probably the, the thing I hear more than anything else from people right now is just get something done. There is a severe fatigue with anybody in Washington, D.C. not getting things done. And so um, that's how, what I talk about. I talk about health care. I talk about people's lives, their economic lives. And I talk about, and I don't say draining the swamp because you can't say that anymore, but I do say it about, you know, making making things work again. Um, and and I, I don't know what the view is in this room, but I believe in bipartisanship. Um, because when you only have 194 seats, we have 194 now uh, because of Connor Lamb, um, but when you have 194 seats, you can't get anything done until you get to 218 votes. So that requires uh, figuring out how you're gonna work with reasonable people. All right, so I, that's the way you get things done, in my opinion. Um, let me say thank you to each and every one of you for uh, your kindness that you showed me today.